The choice of a telescope mount is usually the most overlooked element of your setup, but arguably it's the most important. Usually people will look for the biggest and best telescope they can find and then put it on the cheapest mount that will hold it. And that's not really the best way to go about it. So in this video, I want to run through uh, the different types of mounts, some of the basic features and then some of the more advanced features. Uh, and also what you should look out for and where you should focus your money. A mount's primary purpose is to allow you to locate and track an object in the sky and keep it steady throughout the night. Essentially there are two types of mounts, equatorial mounts known as EQ mounts and altitude azimuth mounts also known as out as mounts. Out as mounts are similar to a camera mount so you can move them left and right and up and down. EQ mounts on the other hand are a little bit more complicated. They uh, move on an axis uh, which is aligned with the Earth's rotational axis. The major difference between these mounts is that as an object rises in the east, passes the meridian at its highest point and then sets in the west, an out as mount will have the object slowly rotate in the eyepiece or the detector throughout the night, whereas an EQ mount will maintain the same orientation throughout the night. EQ mounts are almost universally the German equatorial design, however there are some other designs that do get used such as the fork mount which have their own pros and cons, uh, but for simplicity I'll focus on the German equatorial mounts only. Out as mounts include the standard out as mounts, fork mounts and Dobsonian mounts, however these all essentially operate in the same way. Each mount has a purpose, and you just need to align your requirements with the capability of the mount itself. While EQ mounts maintain a consistent image orientation, there are some downsides. Typically, when an object passes the meridian, which is the north-south line, EQ mounts will need to perform a flip, known as a meridian flip, to continue tracking. This can interrupt an observing session at the time when the object is at its highest and providing the best views. Also, if you have a Newtonian telescope on an EQ mount, the location of the eyepiece changes throughout the night and can get into awkward positions to look through. EQ mounts also need to be polar aligned. So this is where the alignment of the axis of the rotation is aligning with the rotation of the Earth. Generally this is done via a process called drift alignment and there also is some software that can be used uh, to help with this process. Polar alignment can be a bit of a pain when you're not used to it, but it does get uh, easier over time. Out as mounts, on the other hand, are straightforward to set up. All you need to do is find some reference stars and away you go. You always have the eyepiece in a predictable location and generally don't require to do a meridian flip. But although nearly all professional telescopes are out as, unless you have a high precision field derotator, these are not great for imaging deep sky objects. The basic rule of thumb is that if you're doing imaging, you need an EQ mount. If you're only observing and taking planetary images, then you can get away with having an out as mount. There are a few things that you should keep an eye on when looking for what mount is best for you. Capacity. Not just for the telescope that you have at the moment, but also for the equipment that you might purchase in the future and maybe an upgrade of the telescope itself. So how much weight are you going to put on your telescope mount? And you need to consider all the bits and pieces including an off-axis guider, um, a camera, um, eyepieces, things like that, uh, and also things that you are likely to put onto the future. You never want to overload your mount. The performance will absolutely suffer and depending on your mount, you should probably not look at exceeding around 60% of the listed capacity. Most mounts have motors these days uh, and are generally the go-to systems, but you should be aware of if the mount you're looking at is motor driven or not, and also does it have a comprehensive uh, database of objects to find. Uh, most handsets these days are virtually identical, so this shouldn't be much of a problem. If you're looking to image, then you'll definitely want an autoguider port. An autoguider port allows you to connect a secondary camera that monitors a single star and sends corrections to the mount if the star starts to deviate from the center. It's a really important feature for imaging, and even if you don't have an autoguider system yet, you're almost guaranteed to upgrade to one when you find you can't image for long enough. 
If it's available, you should look to see the periodic error specifications. This tells you how much variability there is in the mechanics of the mount when it's driving the telescope. Higher quality mounts tend to have smaller periodic error. This means that fewer corrections are needed to keep the star as a pinpoint. Reducing the periodic error and also the capacity is really where the dollars come into play, but it's an indication of the quality of the machining of the product itself. Many mounts also offer periodic error correction training. So this means that you can record how the mount performs over time and have the mount predict the issues with the gears and automatically correct for them. Some people have been quite successful with uh, periodic error correction and taking it an average mount and getting it to perform as well as something that's a lot more expensive. The other thing you should look out for is pointing accuracy. This is how close to centre an object will be when you navigate to it. Having a good pointing accuracy means that you spend less time searching for the object and centering them and more time imaging or observing. The last thing to keep an eye out for is computer control. Some mounts allow you to control your mount via computer, others can be done via some third party software and some cables. Controlling your telescope via a computer allows you to do a number of things that you might not otherwise be able to do. Things like plate solving, dithering, automatic meridian flipping, full automation, things like that. Things that are probably more complicated than the topic of this uh, video, but something that is available when you get a bit more advanced in your imaging. Thinking about the direction you want to take with the imaging now may stop you from wasting money and uh, going through a quick upgrade process. So all the features that I've listed before, uh, what should you focus on, where should you uh, put your money into? So if you're observing, the number one priority for you is ease of use, something that's light, that can be movable, portable. The, the mount that gets uh, used the most is generally the mount that's the lightest and easiest to use. Uh, the second priority is the mount should be driven or go to. And the next one would be pointing accuracy, which is not completely important in observing, but can help uh, throughout the night. And finally, you should keep an eye out on capacity. While it's less important when observing as opposed to imaging, uh, if you don't have a mount that can take the telescope that you're putting onto it, when you make focusing adjustments, it can tend to vibrate quite a lot and take some time to steady. If you're imaging, the number one priority for you is capacity. You need to make sure that your telescope can be safely carried on the mount that you're choosing, along with all the gear, equipment, and also the future telescope that you buy. You don't want to underpower your mount. The next one is a driven or go-to system. So it's an absolute must have. It has to be a driven or go-to system uh, in order to, to do imaging of any, any quality. The next one is an auto guider port. You absolutely want to have an auto guider port. Uh, you will, if you don't have one at the moment, you will upgrade to an auto guider, I guarantee you. Uh, the next thing is periodic error. So getting the smallest periodic error is, is really important. While you can guide it out uh, and improve your tracking through auto guiding, you'd rather have the error not tracked out and eliminated before you even, even uh, make corrections. Uh, periodic error correction training is probably the next one. So uh, if you don't have a great periodic error, you can correct for that and maybe get it into a little bit of a better position. And finally, pointing accuracy. It's not as important uh, for a imaging setup, but it will allow you to reduce the time that you have centering your objects, um, which does make for a better uh, and more enjoyable imaging run. So recommendations. If you're doing observing only, uh, and you know that you only want to do observing, so you'll probably want to go with a Dobsonian, a driven uh, go-to Dobsonian mount. If you're uh, into astrophotography and you want to get into that in the future, the mount that gives you the best bang for your bucks and provides a wide variety of features and pretty much all the features that I've listed as your priorities above is the NEQ6 or NEQ5, depending on the capacity that you're looking to put onto, onto the mount. I've heard also some good things about the Celestron C-Gem, but I haven't used one personally. 
But the key thing is to do your research first to see uh, what you're getting is, fits your needs and fits your purposes. And then buy something that's a little bit bigger, a little bit better, a little bit more expensive uh, than you initially thought you might want to get. You absolutely won't regret it. If you're looking to invest in this hobby, the mount is really one where you want to spend your money. You can get good images out of an average scope on a great mount, but you'll always get terrible results from a fantastic telescope on a bad mount. So thanks for listening to this video, and until next time, I hope you have clear dark skies.